Hello, everyone. My name is Kate. And this is Karis. And you're listening to ArtWise. Hello, everyone. Welcome to ArtWise. So today I have with me Karis. You want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself a little bit further and talk about uh, who you are and what you do? Yes. So I'm Karis and I'm the owner of Charisma Design Studio. And I love to work with passionate and introspective artisans and craftsmen who are ready to thrive in a world of mass production. And I'm kind of a nature fanatic and a little obsessed. In a, in a kick-ass illustrator brand (laughs) person (laughs) yeah so I am so excited for this episode we got kind of like a mishmash of topics today so uh whatever whatever comes through I'm not gonna try to like contain it too much uh it's just whatever we end up talking about I mean I do have questions planned but if we stray away from those whatever you know Going with it. Yeah, whatever whatever chat GPT spit out is what we're talking about today. <laughs> Honestly, haven't even really read them yet, so this will be interesting. Ooh. So, <laughs> and I also, right before we started recording, we talked for like 20 minutes and I took, I took my CBD, my CBD oil and I am just feeling really like good. I was having a very stressful morning because I have a, a lot of stuff to do this, this week, but I'm feeling really great and i'm excited to be here today (laughs) and i'm excited to you had a lot of interesting topics i I don't Mm. even remember what you sent me but i remember thinking wow those are good topics we haven't talked about any of that stuff yet so i definitely wanted to give you some just something that made you feel passionate about it i feel passionate about everything (laughs) it's like I like I'm I feel like if if I had to describe myself in three words, I would probably use passionate as one of my three words, like creative, passionate and big. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Not in like the traditional sense of big, but like Mm -hmm. just energetically big. Expansive. Sure. That's a good word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I don't feel like I'm growing. I just feel like I was born big, you know, not like physically big energetically big you mm. know what I mean mm-hmm. like like you take space yeah I take I do take <laughs> <laughs> I, I do take up a lot of space it's so true I'm not gonna feel bad about it anymore <laughs> you shouldn't you shouldn't we need the space takers <laughs> I know right like we have the whole universe to take so much space but the first the first question that I had for you that we're gonna talk about is about nature. See, I love nature. I I don't know about you. When I go outside, I talk to the trees. I talk to the trees. The trees, I don't know if anybody... Look, I'm about to get a little woo-woo over here. So this is kind of nuts. Okay, let's do it. Let's just talk about it because it came in my head. So it must be a reason for it, right? I could help people right now. So when I have... So I have... I got diagnosed with chronic migraine when I was 18, but I've had it since I was 11, but I didn't get diagnosed until I was an adult. And um, I spent like three years on a bunch of different medications, like trying to get rid of it. And like, you can't because it's like chronic and genetic. (laughs) So like, pretty much like when you have it, you can't get rid of it. But I don't meet the criteria for it anymore. And like, the reason for that is because of trees in nature. And like, I'm not even like, I'm not even kidding right now. When I tell you, if you go outside and look, there's studies on this, okay? There are studies on chronic migraine, and it's, like, been scientifically proven that meditating helps with it. But if you lean your spine, so, like, trees are, like, antennas for the earth, (laughs) like, earth energy. So if you lean with your spine against a tree and you just are like, hey, tree, can you help make my migraine go away? They will. And like, I'm not even kidding because I've tried my whole life to get rid of this, like these migraines, and I still get them. But as soon as I start to get one, if I go outside and like sit under a tree and just meditate for an hour, it'll either go away or it'll be significantly better. 
And it could just be the meditating if you don't believe in trees. I don't know why you wouldn't believe in trees. They're very real. They're right there. <laughs> they, Yeah, they are very real. But if you don't believe in like tree healing, the meditation alone does help. And it's crazy because you think like, I used to always think, oh, if I sit here and just think about how much pain I'm in, like it gets worse, but it really doesn't. Like it actually does help significantly. So fun fact, but I do love nature, but I wasn't a nature person before I was a nature person. Before I was a nature person, I was a city girl. You know, I like lived in the city and I had no nature. Yeah. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I lived in Tampa at, actually at the beginning of this podcast through the second, through most of the second season, I didn't live in like a nature area ever until like almost a year ago now when I moved into the shed in my aunt's yard. And my aunt has like so much nature. And I thought I was being cursed legitimately because I, I had like my dream apartment in the city and I thought like that was like the end all be all. And so when after I quit my job to start my business and like my rent got freaking doubled, like with 10 days notice, I thought that like getting sent here was like actually like a curse but it's been so healing to like be in nature. And I didn't realize how much I liked it because I had never really had the opportunity. Like I grew up in a suburb and then I moved to the city. But now I live in an area where I, ha I like I have like all of this nature and all of these animals around me. And it's just so like it's been really good for me creatively too. Mm -hmm. just I feel like I don't have to pull from my own like bank of energy anymore because I can just go out and I can feel really relaxed and like I feel like like as someone who I get kind of like I expend a lot of energy <laughs> I expend a lot of energy just like naturally because I'm very uh it's I I put up like a front I feel like on social media that I'm like a very high energy person I can go really fast but like it spends quick you know what I mean like I've got about three good hours of this before it just runs out so when I go out into nature I feel like I can pull from the nature or I feel like I don't I don't feel the need to go fast and like be loud and you expend all my energy because like there's no need for it and i love exactly. animals too we have so many chickens and bunnies and stuff so it's it's been very nice but the the question that i had for you that was a very long-winded way of asking a question but we're on a podcast here we have like a whole hour so might as well how has nature served as a muse for artists i already answered that for me but for artists for you uh throughout the decades and how do you see craftsmanship intertwined with this inspiration. Wow, chat GPT. I don't even understand that question. Do you understand it? Well, thankfully <laughs> you sent these to me uh, a few days ago or like yesterday. So I've been kind of mulling it over. Cause I was like, these are hard, hard questions. Thanks chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I try to answer it, my brain goes into this like spiral of art history. I guess. If, okay. I guess if we break it down into how has nature served as a muse for artists throughout decades, I, instantly think of like I also think of impressionism and post-impressionism and then two of my favorite movements well I do love impressionism but uh, art nouveau and arts and crafts movement and everyone kind of knows impressionism Van Gogh Gauguin I actually kind of really don't like Gauguin <laughs> but Suzanne all of them but I feel like you can always see that because the plain air was huge during impressionism and people were out in nature and they were exploring it and the world was changing, but they always went back to nature as a way to find inspiration and feel introspective about the world and find meaning in how quickly the world was shifting and changing because nature has always stayed the same, but I have like notes. <laughs> I got off topic, but I guess so. I did write that Van Gogh, he was like, he's one of the figureheads for, in my opinion, for finding inspiration in nature. Because everything he created really drew from nature, like Starry Night, that was the sky. He painted that from memory every single night. His sunflowers, which I personally love the story behind the sunflowers, they were thrown out and in a gutter because they were like half wilted and he found beauty in them and he took them in and painted them. 
which I think is like the ultimate way to find beauty in nature, kind of that Japanese wabi-sabi finding beauty in the passage of time and decay and death. And that's a bit of a tangent from the original question, but, and then how do you see craftsmanship intertwined with this inf- uh, inspiration? I think if you look at arts and crafts movement and Art Nouveau, nature is such a proponent of it, or I don't know how to describe it, but so in the arts and crafts movement, you have like William Morris and all of his wallpaper was inspired by nature and wanting to bring nature into the world of mass production and find that harmony between the two. And then you have Art Nouveau. And my favorite artist from that period was uh, Alphonse Musha. And he, he found an interesting balance between nature and femininity. And he used both of them to kind of heighten the beauty of the other, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, so kind of a long, but yeah, chat GBT, that was a hard one to answer. I think it, it, it had so many. <laughs> yeah. It had a lot of twists and turns mm-hmm. and it was poorly worded. I rate this chat GPT question a one out of 10. 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That works. <laughs> the next one is actually pretty good though. I was kind of reading it over it. So this is less about nature and more about psychological experiences in specific artists of, I guess, the past. I don't know. Presently, too. I, you know, I have psychological experiences. But the question is, can can you highlight specific artists like Van Gogh or... Alphonse Musha. Alphonse Musha. It's a miracle I was able to pronounce that. And discuss their psychological experiences, how their psychological experiences shaped their unique styles and their works. So, oh, if you thought the art nerd came out <laughs> with the first question, this one's going to be rough. So, I feel like so many people love Van Gogh, but a lot of people don't maybe know his past and what got him to you know the asylum that we all know that he went to and created all of his masterworks um but he's a really interesting case because his adulthood was really rough but also his upbringing was rocky too uh and it was clear he had a lot of mental illness um but he always cared about the people around him because when he was his father was a pastor And he wanted to follow in his father's footsteps and he went to go minister to a coal miners town and he was so generous with the people that he was giving the clothes off his own back. But the, I guess, I don't know how church was structured back then, but I guess the people that were like supporting him were like, you're being too generous. And they told him that he shouldn't be a pastor, which is very ironic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that is weird. <laughs> yeah, so all he wanted to do was help people. He had I feel like he had this very introspective love for nature and people and just life in general. But it wasn't the norm back then, so he was really rejected because of it, which I think led him to turn to substance abuse as a way to cope, but I think because of that turmoil, he found so much solace and art and capturing nature where his heart was. I feel bad for that guy. He had like such a sad life. Anybody who's listening to this uh, who hasn't listened to the first couple episodes of ArtWise, we covered Van Gogh like episode two, like very early on. But I think we mostly talked about his death. I don't I don't remember. This was almost four years ago now. Jeez. I don't remember how much we talked about his life, but we definitely talked about because like we had some interesting, me and my old co-host, we had some interesting theories about how he died. <laughs> yes. So. Yes. That's always up for debate if it was a accident or purposeful or. I think somebody killed him. You know what? Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> I, I think I, somebody killed him. I do. I do think that because there's a theory like these two boys accidentally shot him. I thought that that they had, they shot his ear and then that's how he lost his ear. And it wasn't that he like cut off his own ear. It was that they shot off his ear. I don't know, because I haven't I have not heard that theory. I've heard the theory that 
either that because of he was living where they had like the running of the bulls, I guess, and they cut off the bull's ear. And it was either that that influenced it because he was on a psychotic break a little bit or because he was also kind of it's believed that he was deeply religious because of his upbringing. And that when I think it was Peter that got his ear cut off in the garden and he was like trying to recreate that, maybe. I don't know. Those are the two theories I've heard for his ears. I've not heard it being shot off, though. I will will look that up. I I've heard that he like didn't cut off his own ear. I'll just say that. Like I've heard that he wasn't the one to do it, but I've I've also heard no he was, but like also I don't think he died by suicide because like why would he? Like why would I don't know. I guess I could ask that of anybody who's ever committed suicide like why would you do that? But also like I don't know. Like he was I don't know. He was like a vibe. I feel so bad for the guy. He it's such a hard life. He yeah. was a vibe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I feel so bad for him. But also, like, I don't know. He made some really great stuff. He was a he was a cool man. I I hope that I can see some of his works in person one day. I think that the I have an art museum that's like near me, uh, the Salvador Dali Museum, mm-hmm. and they have like guest exhibits, and there was. Have you been to the live Salvador Dali? No. Is that what it's called? The live? It's like living Salvador Dali. It's it's like a basically they fill the room with like all of these huge projectors and like his art is like moving on the walls and there's music and stuff. I don't I don't remember exactly what it is called, but it was very cool. I went for my 21st birthday. That's what I did. <laughs> That sounds amazing. I know they yeah. they, uh, blech, they did one for Van Gogh, uh, and I as soon as I saw it, I was like, I want that. <laughs> I think it's called Van Gogh Alive. Yeah, something like that. So, something similar to that. If that's if that's not it, but it, it was very cool. Highly recommend if it if they ever bring it near you because it travels around. But yeah, that. But I want to see like his actual works. But I don't know if I'll get to because I'm sure. I I don't know. I don't know how much of his art is in museums. There, that, I know there's one located in. Yeah, like I'd ever go there. I have never left Florida in my entire life. <laughs> but but if they if they would bring it to me, mm-hmm. love that for me. I would, you know, if it's Be in, there. you know, within mm-hmm. a couple hours of Tampa, yeah. <laughs> I'll go see it. But I don't know. But do you know who this Alphonse? Musha, Musha? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> do you know who that is? I don't even know who that is. Sorry, I'm a bad. I'm not like, I'm not the best at art history. Sorry, I know that's like ironic. I host an art history podcast, but we don't have to talk about all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just. I mean, I took one. I guess I took a graphic design history and then an art history course in college, and of course, my brain was like, yes, and just soaked it all up. But Alphonse Musha, and by the way, I didn't know that you are supposed to pronounce his last name as like either Musha or Muha. Muha. Didn't know that day. Yeah, that's, I think, Czech- the Czechoslovakian way of pronouncing it. Oh, is- I like Muha. Muha. <laughs> I think, I, you know, Muha. Uh, I like yeah, that better. Mm. Alphonse Muha. Muha. <laughs> He so everyone knows Art Nouveau. It's actually coming back pretty strong right now in the graphic design world. But he's one of my personal favorite artists. And there's actually a lot of overlap, I feel like, with how he was as a person and who Van Gogh was. But I'm trying to remember exactly his early life, but Muha was a singer musician turned artist. He started as a singer in the church and then I guess he went to go sing at like a theater thing, but then puberty hit, so he had to play an instrument instead. And then he also started working with the stage stuff. And that's when he discovered like that he really loved to work and illustrate plants and nature and a lot of voluminous feminine looking forms. Uh, and then he, I guess, became a graphic designer in some ways. And he was kind of in the right place at the right time. And he got a commission for this poster that, blew up in popularity people were even like ripping it off the street walls to go and put in their home and i feel Mm -hmm. like most people probably know his art but not his name he's the one that made the 
the women with the crowns, the intricate crowns behind them. It's very Art Nouveau that everyone knows. Got the hair. Wait, hold on. <laughs> I might have to hold on. I'm going to Google him. Mm -hmm. Actually, stand by. <laughs> Once you see it, I'm I'm betting that you've seen his stuff before. Other people recreate it in that style all the time. I've never seen any of this before. Wow. Really? <laughs> no, sorry. Oh my goodness. Nope. I'm more this shocked is... that the art world has failed. <laughs> well, my podcast is, I mean, look, I, beautiful. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's beautiful. Never seen it before. <laughs> Maybe it just comes to me because I love it so much. That's, that's what it is. That's possible. The art that's world possible. has failed in, in anointing this man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, ChatGPT didn't, though. So, win. Win. Man, there we go. <laughs> okay, I give this question a 8 out of 10. Hmm. Well, I, get, I will say, so the, huh, I feel bad I always get on these tangents, but the original point was how their psychology. Oh, them. yes. Yes. We didn't answer it yet. Okay. Well, it's I, was, I tangent. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do that too. I withdraw my rating. I will give an updated one at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I love this rating system. Uh, I guess in summary is that both him and Van Gogh had this. They both came up in religious backgrounds, which is interesting, but they both seem to combine nature with its introspective, nostalgic comfort almost. And so when life was throwing all of their curveballs at them, they used this foundation of nature to make themselves who they're known to be today which i think is interesting and they they seem to find a lot of solace in all of the issues of the world that was going on because i mean van gogh had his own personal things but then muha was living i think i think he was predominant in the turn of the century first world war so imagine what's going on then <laughs> so he, he was contending with a lot but I just find it really interesting that both of them seem to have a very similar way of finding solace in nature and then using it to make a name for themselves. But that was that was that summary. I have notes, so my brain is like, must say notes. <laughs> no, I I get it. And I honestly I feel like I feel like art is almost like a reflection for at least at least like most artists. <laughs> It's a reflection of your mind in some regard. I definitely have, event art like really does help. I literally wrote a whole graphic novel about an experience that I had. I have not illustrated it yet, but I've like done like little illustrations here and there for it. And it's like, it's actually so nice. I'm interested. <laughs> Maybe. I, hopefully one day it'll get finished because I I volunteered. So I had a really awesome art teacher in high school and I still volunteer. And now that I live back in the area that I grew up in, uh, which for a few years I lived in the city and I couldn't do this. But um, upon like moving back here, I definitely like wanted to start volunteering for her again. And so I volunteered for her and she was asking me, she's like, Oh, what kind of stuff have you been making? And I was like, Oh, I'll show you. And I was showing her some of the stuff that I've made recently. And I'm like, yeah, it's just cause like I'm depressed. And she was like, actually like this would make a good graphic novel. And um, actually for anybody who's watching the video version of this right now, I will try and remember to put up on the screen. What time is it? 25 minutes in bet. Okay, so <laughs> I did this illustration and it's like this girl falling and all of, she's surrounded by like all of these pictures and all of these picture frames and they're like taking from her and she's like glowing and it's very, um, it's very comic book. Like it's mm. very comic book. But my art teacher gave me this idea and she was like, okay, that's like the cover and every chapter on the inside is like each one of the photos. And I was like, you brilliant woman. I would have never thought of that because I already had. So then after that, I came up with like a whole storyboard and I'd love to finish it. But oh, my God, the idea of taking on a project that big, horrifying. You could do it. That sounds amazing. I feel like I could do anything I put my mind to. The question is, is it going to be worth 
am I am I going to get a return on that time investment? Oh my god, I think you can. <laughs> it would be fun though. It would definitely be fun. I that's something I would definitely want to do in the future. But like though, that's like a perfect example of taking your life experiences and making art out of it in a very literal way. Because I definitely. I'm not one of the greats or anything, but like that's just my example of like how even just like regular modern day artists, like normal people, do that. And I know, oh, a good example of this. She's a uh, see. These are the types of artists I know. They're like people who are alive right now, still making <laughs> art. Raina Tell. Oh God, how do I pronounce her last name? Raina Tell Greg Merkemeiner. Is that one whole name? (laughs) Okay. Raina. I I had to look up the spelling. Mm -hmm. Raina Telgemeierer. Yeah. She's a. I'm not even going to try to spell that. Well, she literally has made like four, like three graphic novels just about her life, like her her, her own childhood, just re illustrating like what happened to her. And I grew up. Have you heard of Smile, the book? It's a graphic novel called Smile. And it's about a girl who gets braces. I feel like if I saw it, I, my brain usually does not remember things. So wise. the book, blue, big smiley face, like yellow smiley face is smiling braces mm-hmm. on the smile. And it just says it's called Smile. I feel like I've seen that. You've probably seen it in like a Target or something. It's mm-hmm. it, it was a bestseller. Uh, but yeah, she's she illustrates graphic novels she had one yeah so she has one called smile and it's about when she got braces she has one called guts that's about her emetophobia which i also have so i have not read that one drama and that's about her experience in like drama club i did read that one because i was also in drama club i just relate to her so much we're twins but anyway yeah so she she's just amazing such an inspo for my little plan but i don't know if i ever will go through maybe one day but yeah (laughs) i think you could do it i think you have the talent behind you to do it thanks i just it's so much work Mm -hmm. and i whenever i pressure myself to do like a big project like that it it kind of stresses me out and i'm not in a in a place where i'm ready to feel stressed i don't (laughs) yeah yeah like i feel like i'm still kind of working on this is so silly, but like I'm really working hard to get like my own mental health in check before I take on anything huge like that. Because if I can figure out how to de escalate my stress and my like natural anxiety that comes with doing literally anything before it gets to that point, then I know I will be okay to take on a project that large that's probably going to take me like multiple years to finish and like have the willpower to follow through right now where I'm currently at I I don't know that I would finish it truthfully I've started so many big projects like that and not finish them and there's a few really big projects that I know are going to take me like upwards of like one to two years to complete that I just kind of like put on the back burner because every time I think about it I get stressed so I was like I don't want to do that so I have to like figure myself my situation out before I take on big projects like that. And also, those are things that you have to keep in mind as a freelancer. Those aren't things that are going to pay while I'm working on them if I'm going to decide to like self-publish or something like that. That's not something I'm going to make money from until after it's finished. That's and true. so if the project is going to take a year, and I can't just not have money for a year, so I have to focus on like my my freelance projects with like clients and stuff and like build up more of a savings before I actually feel confident enough to take on a project that big too. There's a lot of like barriers that I'm kind of slowly chipping away at before I decide maybe these big projects are like worth it. But I do have a lot of things that I want to do like a lot. (laughs) I mean, I think it's good that you're focusing on healing the mental part of it before jumping in. I think that's going to function your best. Yeah. I feel like a lot of, artists struggle with mental health I don't think that's like I mean well I think a lot of people struggle with mental health not just artists but I think most people especially like in the times that we live in it's just not it's just yeah it's not made easy like we're literally farmed for labor and if you're not a productive like I I'm I'm a productive person but I don't I don't have a lot of energy to expend on work unless I'm truly passionate about it 
So yeah. when I worked in, in corporate design, it really like it drained me to the point where it took me almost a full year to recover to where I was able to work full days again. And it's it's hard because not everybody is is built for that. In fact, I think most people probably aren't built to work themselves to death the way we're expected to in order to be able to survive. And it's just like, it causes, it's it's caused an interesting, I think, art movement. I feel like in history, people are going to look back at this as like the COVID art movement. And instead of there being like these famous artists, it's just collective from literally everybody that was trapped inside their house. And then later on, like now, I feel like we're potentially starting to come out of the COVID era and into like the AI era where like everybody's just battling like mid journey and (laughs) Dolly or or is Dolly one of them? I forget. Yeah, I think so. Or it was, but I think mid journey has taken most of the, yeah, but it keeps being updated and it's amazing and whatever. Yeah. It's, there's a lot, there's a lot of issues I think. And, and, Something that I think about a lot is a few years ago, right? Like when I was still at my my corporate job, I never even like I knew I struggle with anxiety and stuff like that. And I'm like, I think everybody kind of does to, to some degree. But mine was yeah. actually like it, I, at the time compared to where I'm at now, it was pretty bad. But I wasn't even thinking about this is something I need to work on because that wasn't an option. I I was like in full survival mode. Like I have to work 60 hours this week. Like I have to do this. I have to do that. Like I like I wasn't even giving myself time to think. And then when I made the decision, like, okay, I actually can't live like this. (laughs) Like I like I am young and I feel like I'm about to die because of how much I'm working. And once I recognize that and I like, Made, like actively decided to make changes it wasn't until I realized oh I don't have to live like this you know like I don't have to hate hate my life and now it's like I've realized okay I actually have like a big journey ahead of me in terms of like mental like get like optimizing my my mental Happy. to where I can do the things that I want to do because I do like I do think like yeah I am capable of of illustrating and a graphic novel that I've written. I do believe that, but I also, and I know the, the more time I put off doing it, the, the time of this kind of being wasted, but I also, I want to be at a place where I'm confident that it'll get finished. And right now, I don't know. <laughs> I'd love to, but I don't know, you know? Mm, I understand that. Yeah. I mean, I, I relate to that because I, uh, I took a gap year before going to college just because of physical, um, undiagnosed physical stuff. But so it's been a year at this point that I've been graduated from college. And I knew coming out of it, I did not want to go into corporate because I knew how it would affect my health. And so that was just a boundary I set. And that's honestly, you know, when life started to feel like it was kind of coming together oddly enough. Like I didn't see the the steps I was taking. I was confident in, I didn't see the path I was on though, but I felt confident in the steps. And that's when um, I came across the brief collective, which is how we met because we Mm -hmm. both had gone through that course. But yeah, it's interesting figuring out the balance between mental health and what's required of you to live. And yeah. That, that's a whole other that's a whole other podcast isn't it yeah I mean I'm not I'm not opposed to talking about it because it is it is related to your how your experiences shape you know your work and that's literally the next question is in, in your personal journey as an artist how 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 do everything that we talked about not just because I mean what these these questions are fine and all but I don't want to you know we have a good We're going with it yeah yeah, we're just going with it. So, you know, being immersed in the world of art, how has this affected your perception of of life and the way you express yourself? And I want to I want to expand on this question a little bit actually because I think the wording being immersed in the world of art, I feel like that can be taken like a lot of different ways and I feel like the world of art changes drastically depending on what time period you're in. And I feel like actually we're very lucky in the sense to live in such a crazy well at least 
I personally feel lucky to live in such a crazy time because how you know how many people are going to be able to say that they lived through like the world literally basically collapsing as we knew it in 2020 and like now we're trying to like rebuild like it's actually insane I I don't know I'm probably a little bit weird but I love chaos I used to intentionally put myself in like these crazy situations just because I knew it would be a good story and that I'd come out of it okay and I still kind of am like wow like this is like what a time to be alive (laughs) I love that mentality that's amazing but the world of art is it's just interesting because when when you say like I am a I'm a human being who I have immersed myself in this world of art not only are you saying I've lived through this period where art has is changing through AI and through COVID and through all of these other things. Not only am I living through that, but I've also, I've done all the research. I know all the history. I know what art was like before this and before that and before that and before that and and so on. Like how, how does this affect your life and the way that you express yourself Mm -hmm. as an artist? Well, I feel like it's, it's kind of a, that chicken or the egg sort of thing is that did the personality like who I was born as did that make me have an affinity for art or did the exploration of art give me the personality that I have it's kind of hard to figure out but I feel like art has helped me in a lot of different ways because it's taught me to be patient (laughs) it's taught me to be introspective and live in the moment which is a stubborn issue of mine of of being too forward focused future focused which probably causes a lot of anxiety but I think art I think art gives me a lot of the qualities that I'm proud of in myself and I probably wouldn't have them if I didn't love art and actively pursue like getting better at it if that makes sense (laughs) yeah I honestly I I talk about this on social media a lot, but I really like in my journey, I fought being an artist so hard. <laughs> I don't know why I did. I my dad's an artist and I didn't I didn't want to like follow in his footsteps or whatever. And uh I ended up literally getting the exact same job that he started out as like a production artist and and everything and it's just like there was no escaping it for me I literally tried so hard I was like I I had plans to go to college for uh chemistry wow oh that would have been rough (laughs) yeah I took I took three years of chemistry in high school and I took like some AP chem classes and some organic chem dual enrollment classes and then in college, I wanted to continue doing it. And it just wasn't in the cards at all. And after I graduated high school, I was like desperately looking for work. And I swear the only job that I could find that seemed even remotely fun was at the custom t shirt shop as a graphic designer. Like it wasn't even like I want to be a graphic designer. It was like, I'm looking for work in this area. And this is the only thing available that pays decently that I know I can do because from growing up in an artistic household, I knew illustrator and photoshop and stuff so i was like okay i guess i'll do that and then after that it was just like it was game over felt very like forced into it and i've always loved art and like art history to some degree but also like i'm really i'm really big on like modern art just like artists who are currently alive i have a lot of artists who i look up to who are like i could like if i i could potentially meet these people hypothetically maybe (laughs) you know because like they're still around and popping so but yeah it's it's interesting to hear other people's journey and their perspective in terms of how they kind of found art and design and whatever they do creatively is just every time I get a new guest on this podcast it's always interesting because everybody's so different some people have always known. I feel like intuitively I always knew. I always drew like I always like even though I didn't I didn't know if I wanted to pursue it or not until I was like in high school uh as a car- as a career. I don't know. It just I really I feel like I really fought it. And then I wanted to go to art school and I couldn't do that and then I still ended up doing it. So it's like 
whole a whole thing but <laughs> i guess it didn't really matter in the end because i still would have ended up where i am probably no matter what i did yeah <laughs> i mean for me i guess i don't really have i don't know i feel like some people have these you know stories where art was their solace or art was something that they felt like your story but they ended up doing anyways for me it was just I drew and growing up I drew as soon as I could hold a pencil and it was just something I enjoyed and I guess my my mother encouraged it because everyone on my mom's side of the family they're all creative they're either mathematicians or super creative or amazing at cooking and baking or singing and so it's all kind of that like someone had to fall you had to fall somewhere in there and so I had a lot of cousins who were creatives and I think watching them maybe is what cemented that now that I'm thinking about it but art just felt natural for me at a young age and my parents were incredibly supportive I I think they saw that I had an affinity for it and they were like sure, we'll support you, go for it. And I chose graphic design, though, as a major because uh, I enjoyed graphic design, but it felt like, like every artist here is, it's less turbulent than being an artist. Like, you won't make money as an artist. It's so turbulent. But so, yeah, I, I mean, I think now that I have a graphic design business, I'm able to incorporate illustration, and it makes me really happy to be able to do that. Mm hmm but I got off the original topic a little bit. <laughs> I forget what the original no, thing was. That's exactly what we were talking about. Mm. No, and I, I feel the same way. I was really lucky. And like, I was also like, I've always, ever since I was a little kid, I always liked to draw. And like, when I say I fought it, I meant like as a career, I kind of fought mm. it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Because I, I don't know, I, I didn't want to struggle. I, I saw, you know, my parents kind of struggled with money growing up and I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> but as an adult now, like I feel like when you when you know, you know. And that's when it comes to kind of everything, like not not just career, but like especially with like ar- being an artist, being a creative, like when you're a kid and like they stick the pencil in your hand and you're drawing because you love to do it. It's almost like, well, what else would I do? You know? Like I don't know. I I wouldn't. I mean, I think I'd be a good chemist, probably, but (laughs) I don't know. I have a chemistry tattoo. Oh my goodness! Oh, I want to see that. (laughs) It's on my shoulder. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah, I'm a nerd. (laughs) (laughs) I love nerds. We're all nerds in some capacity. Yeah. I guess the way the way you're describing it, I think I think for me, art is a certain tether to this is going to get a little bit psychological here, but I kind of look at my last few, not my last years of life, but my essentially my whole life as these two big chunks of, I grew up, I had a really happy childhood. Of course there's like turbulent times, but you know, I was very happy. But then when puberty hit, I, started having a lot of undiagnosed pain and like unknown symptoms that were just so confusing and trying to figure out what they all were. And 12 years later, I now have gone through surgery and have a proper diagnosis for what it all was. But I guess in my brain, I look back at those years of without pain. It's kind of like these golden years and I grew up in nature and around nature. So nature heavily is heavily tethered to those years of freedom Mm -hmm. and it's kind of like a it's just a nice big flow of nature or art connects me to nature and nature connects me to a time of freedom and happiness so I think that's why art has always been consistent for me yeah so that makes a lot of sense yeah no I think a lot of people there's a quote that I've said a few times on this podcast and I hate Picasso but it's a Picasso quote of course (laughs) he always uh he said something along the lines of like artists are like children who didn't grow up or some shit like that I don't remember but yeah it's yeah it's a lot of people I think tie creativity and like stuff like that to something you do as children I think it's actually ironically I think it's part of the reason why artists and designers don't get a lot of respect as an industry which is so weird to me because art is everywhere everywhere you look you need it (laughs) society needs it (laughs) 
No, I've seen so many people on social media be like, they market it as something you need, but you really, really don't. And it's like, actually, seriously, think about it for a second. If you saw a business and they had no art, would you purchase from them? They look so suspicious. Are you kidding me? If they mm -hmm. had no brand identity, no consistency, and they just posted random crap and were like, oh, also we're selling this product. Like, would you buy it? Or yes. would you think it was a scam? I personally, I like, mm -mm, mm -hmm. I would not. As you're saying this, I, it instantly <laughs> comes to my mind. So on the topic of like getting the diagnosis, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying this out. And this is supposed to be like a natural remedy for endometriosis and hopefully adenomyosis, which is what I was diagnosed with, both of those. But I had a conversation with my mother yesterday where she was like, it'd probably be less expensive if they didn't spend so much on packaging. I'm like, mom, <laughs> the packaging makes it like that makes the experience. Oh my and gosh. <laughs> I was like, mom, that's my job. And when you like open it and I found this amazing, I'm just going to gush here as a graphic designer for a second. They give you a slip of paper in the tubes of exactly what's in it. And it just elevates the whole experience. And I think that's what makes art important is it takes something bland and every day and turns it into something that's an experience and adds emotion to it. Kind of like if you look at um, some people, people love old Russian architecture, like the, oh my goodness, what is it called? I can't remember it. What? During the World Wars, Russia's political system was Soviet, Soviet Russia. <laughs> I personally yeah. do not like Soviet Russian architecture. I think it's interesting. I would not want to live near it <laughs> because it's just cement everywhere. Yeah. So I think that's what captures why you need art is it adds beauty to the world and it creates experiences and adds more emotion to what you're experiencing. It's so in design too, design specifically is so it's design is objective and art is is subjective. That's true. Both are a little bit subjective, but design usually there's an objective with design like the reason for design is like you said to make the experience better, to a attract a, a certain type of person, uh to ap appeal to a certain group of people, whatever. Like it's it's I don't understand. I will never understand why there are still people out there who are like artists actually don't contribute anything to society. It's like uh, I don't even think we would have like a society. We would just live in like a sad gray world, <laughs> like yeah, exactly. without it. So it's just like I I don't know. It it's crazy to me, but yeah, it's bananas. Bananas insane that people there are still people out there who think it's not. <laughs> necessary like maybe it's just... maybe they just don't like art because of what it requires from them emotionally yeah or they're just jealous that they can't make it themselves That's i know a good. lot of people like that there's a lot of people on social media who really are like actually like my goal is to like i just hate all i literally got that on a comment on my tiktok one time somebody literally said like my goal is actually to just make as many artists as possible cry on here and that's it and i was like why would you comment that first of all like that's even if it's a joke like that's such a sick thing to say like why would you say that first of all second of all i have no second of all why would you say that <laughs> there's a lot of people like that in and I'm not in the community, but like mm. if the community was in a glass building, they'd just be standing there like peeking in, like yelling obscenities. <laughs> like <laughs> and it's it's weird because I've also had a lot of people, if I ever bring it up or talk about it, which I try not to anymore because I don't I I social media is like kind of a whole other other topic that I wasn't even really planning on getting into. But yes. for me, it's it's really I've really especially the last couple of days, I've really struggled with social media. Like last night, I came really close to just deleting all my accounts and just being like, I just I'll figure out how to do this without social media. But I just I don't know if that's possible. But I feel that the, th the things that the things that people say, sometimes like I I'm better at I, I'm slowly adjusting and like getting better to not letting uh, not letting things like that people say get to me. But it's it's so hard because 
you have these people who I, I don't, honestly, I can't find, I'm usually really good about being able to put myself in another person's shoes. And I'm very, I have a lot of, of empathy for people in different situations. And like, that's something I pride myself on. But when I get these like, truly disgusting comments, I cannot, sometimes I do like, I do kind of am like, wow, like, that's so sad that they feel the need to like, take other people down with them to their level. That's like upsetting. Sometimes I do feel like that. But sometimes I'm like, how on earth could you type this, spend the time to type this out, and then send it out to the world with your name on it. (laughs) And like, just be fine with people seeing that. There's oh my so gosh. many there's so many instances in life where I'm like, there's so many steps to getting from point A to point B. You'd think at one of those points, in between there, you would critically think about what you're doing and say, maybe I should not be doing this. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there's, definitely. There's so many points where you can just stop and and really think about what you're doing. Yeah. It's it's a whole a whole mess. Oh man. Well, I guess it's, well, I honestly really hate when people turn, like, mean, uncomfortable things into, like, well, at least it's a, con- like, like stealing, best form of flattery, right? No, it's stealing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what kind of people are like, well, at least, you know, if you know, if you're pissing people off, then at least you're getting a reaction and people are seeing your stuff. I'm like, oh, well, but at least people are seeing your stuff and <laughs> getting a reaction of it, right? <laughs> Yeah, I get that a lot. Like, I I used to I something that I'm really working on right now. So I'm trying really hard to kind of master not complaining anymore. And also identifying like what is complaining versus like what is just like my fun little storytelling that I do to try and put like a fun twist on, you know, stories for my life for my social media, because I try to post every single day if I can. And it's it's been like a slow adjustment, but I feel like I'm finally at a point where I can say I've had people tell me for the first time in my life that I'm such an optimist. I've had people that I'm just now meeting. Oh, you're such an optimist. This is not something that I've ever heard because when I was growing up, when I was a kid, uh, even like my uh, I'm still in my early 20s, but my earlier 20s, like when I was like 19, 20, 21, 22 even like last year, I was just so pessimistic. I always like was preparing. And I think part of that is also like, if you have anxiety, like that's just, that's just part of it. Like you just feel like it's a, it's a coping mechanism. It's a trauma response to prepare for the worst to happen. Yes. But Mm -hmm. when, when you actively are like, okay, I'm going to like, actually, like if I complain, like I'm going to put a dollar in the jar, like I'm not allowed to do it anymore. You really start to actually start to change into a more positive person and it's like crazy to me that like now as like a 23 year old adult I'm meeting these new people and they're like wow like you're such an optimist I have this friend Carly who I met I met her in December of last year and she's like oh of the of the two of us you're definitely the more positive person and I was like you think that like I was so proud of myself I was like no nobody's ever said that to me any any like before ever like I've always been like oh you're such a you're such a narcissist or narcissist that's not the right word you're such a pessimist (laughs) I've been called a narcissist too but I don't think that's true I think Mm. that uh, but also this vibe <laughs> I don't think so, but I have ha- like worried about it before, but usually people say like, oh, if you're worried that you are a narcissist, then you're not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, like I, my whole, my whole upbringing, I've be- always been told like, oh, you're so negative. Like you're such a negative Nancy or a negative Nelly or whatever the f- saying is. And then like for the first time in my life to have like, these people that I'm meeting for the first time say like, no, like you're so positive and you always have like this way of looking at things. I'm like, wow, like it doesn't feel like I'm making changes as much as I probably actually am if other people are are noticing it and like saying these things to me. And it just, it's like a really good feeling to, because it's hard, like when you're inside yourself, it's hard to see where like the progress you've made even as in like if like if you're an artist too right like if you're drawing every single day it's gonna feel like you're not getting any better 
But then if you open your sketchbook from five years ago, you can put them next to each other and see that you're making progress, but you don't really have that ability when it's like your mental health because it's not it's not documented it's like all up here so it's like yeah it's hard but a big thing is like I really try to uh not complain anymore especially on social media but I before I started reading that book and I wasn't really worried about how much I was complaining about things I definitely a lot of my posts on TikTok specifically were like this community is horrible. Like you guys are so mean to each other. I, you know, if I had a child, I wouldn't want them to be an artist because of how mean everybody here is and all this Mm. stuff. And then like some of the comments were people saying, I haven't experienced that at all. Like I must be on the, on the good side of art TikTok or whatever. And then there's like the other half of people who are like, yeah, I just hate artists. They don't contribute anything to society. They're horrible. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's just like a little, a little combination of the two it's a whole thing but I mean I understand that because my when I was much younger my mother did tell me like you just complain too much and that did click something in my brain clicked when she said that and I was like oh maybe I do and it's fine it's kind of finding that balance when you have um chronic pain is that because I do believe in individual responsibility and taking responsibility for yourself and how you react to the world around you and dealing Mm -hmm. with what life is giving you. But it's kind of that balance of being positive, but then understanding where you're, I don't want to say boundaries, but when you're actually in pain or when you're actually not in a good state, that sort of thing is, is finding that balance between voicing that and, but then not being submerged in it constantly and always complaining about it and, and to kind of tie it around, I think that's how art, honestly, like creating art helps me in that way because it it puts me in the moment, but makes me let go of the reins of trying to control the pain and control the reaction and the outcome of everything. Yeah. Um, but I definitely relate to that is learning to become positive about things, even when life isn't really giving you a lot to be positive about. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've noticed that there's always something to be grateful for, even in like the worst possible situations. Like, like, I, I really, like when I, when I had to kind of make room for like the new life that I'm trying to build myself, like through my business, it was really hard. And it's so silly to even think about because like, there are people who do the same thing that I did. But as like, grown adults like in their you know later later late later 30s 40s even like like after retirement there are people who don't even find art until they're you know in their 70s you know and it's like everybody's situation is is so completely different so knowing like how difficult it was for me to quit my corporate job to freelance because I was so worried about security knowing that I didn't have security at my corporate job I made my my measly $15 an hour doing design work like I wasn't even making enough to live then I had five roommates and ate ramen noodles solely and that's all I've eaten for the past like five years um and I'm still doing it like not that much has changed in the realm of like money for me but yet I don't know the idea of not having that like bi-weekly check come in was so scary for me and I knew I I didn't like my situation that I wanted to change it but it was still scary for me I can't even imagine if I if I had a job where I was making like six figures and I felt like I had to leave I don't know that I would have been able to do it. And I'm glad that I left when I did. Like there's like a silver lining and like something to be grateful for in every situation. And it's hard. It's hard to say that because I know some people really are going through it and it's hard. But if you can like, I and like understandably so, like there's a lot going on (laughs) all the time and everybody's life is completely different. But if you can just like find a silver lining or like something that makes you feel better that makes you happy 
I think it makes it makes a big difference, like much bigger than you realize than if you just focus on all of the things that are going wrong and oh, this is wrong, everything's going wrong, nothing's going right. Like it's so it's so helpful to just focus on what's positive, the good things. And art in itself, art is a form, like art creation is a form of meditation. So I struggle to just kind of close my eyes and meditate and like do nothing, that kind of meditation. Mm. I try to do it at least a few times a week, but my daily meditation practice is art. It's drawing, it's illustrating, it's sitting down at my computer and just designing like passion projects. I do one, it's crazy because like I do, I I try to do like one passion project a week because I kind of, I don't know, I crank out art like really quick quickly because I'm I'm definitely not a perfectionist which is honestly it's like good but it's bad because like there is definitely times where I've been like "Eh, this isn't perfect but let's leave it I kind of wish I had a little bit of that I get so paralyzed with um perfectionism sometimes yeah there's like there's benefits and you know there's like some detriment to it as well but for the most part you know Mm. it's it's just like it's hard with like Mm -hmm. the tying art to mental health, especially when the best artists like had the worst mental health and you want to be the best. You want to like force yourself to like, just be constantly working Mm -hmm. on it. But at the same time, like artists again in design too, to some degree is it's all a little bit subjective. So it's like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like this is a good place to start wrapping it up though. We didn't really talk about anything that we were supposed to but I feel like that's fine because I actually really like the direction that this episode went in I don't know how you feel about it but no I like it yeah I mean I love psychology and, and hearing about people's stories and their perspectives on things me too it's part of the reason I started this podcast in the first place uh but thank you Karis for coming on uh I do want to give you this opportunity to plug all of your stuff what services do you offer where can people find you how can they work with you how can they talk to you Anything that you want to promote at all whatsoever, uh, Mm -hmm. the floor is yours. Uh, Well, so I'm on Instagram and I have a website. And for Instagram, it's at Charisma Design Studio, but spelled Charisma Charisma is spelled the way my name is spelled. So C-A-R-I-S. And same thing for my website, Charisma Design Studio. And I offer brand design, illustration, and web design. Yeah. You can contact me through DMs or through the inquiry on my website. Yeah. All right. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add before we close it close it off? Not that I can think of. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much again for coming on. And thank you guys so much for listening if you made it this far. As always, um, the ways that you can support ROIs, uh, just listen to the episodes listen through those ads. Uh, And if you want to donate money to the podcast, I have a contribute to link um, in the Artwise link tree that's on our Instagram account that is at Artwise Podcast. And it'll also be found in the episode description of every single episode. Um, So that wraps it up for this episode of Artwise. And yeah, thank you guys so much again for listening. And I will see all of you next Tuesday. Bye, everyone.